The Big Food Question is partnering with TD Bank on five special episodes about the resilience of small businesses in the face of a constantly shifting pandemic landscape. Listen now, wherever you get your podcasts. Welcome to Pizza Quest. I'm Peter Reinhardt, a man on a never-ending search for the perfect pizza. This show is the audio version of the Pizza Talk YouTube series, where I engage in interesting conversations with some of the country's greatest pizza makers and other artisans. Thanks for joining me on this quest. Hi, I'm Peter Reinhardt, back on Pizza Talk, and today, an interesting segment today, because we're going to be talking about zombies with Athena Actifus, I'm saying it right, Actifus, uh, from uh, Arizona State University. Actually, it's Dr. Athena Actifus. So, and uh, Athena, tell us, number one, what are you a doctor of? And what's your subject and how does it all kind of tie together through zombies? Well, thank you so much for having me on the show. It is a pleasure to be here. Um, I am a doctor of psychology. My PhD is in psychology. So I'm not a um, clinical psychologist. I do research on um, human behavior. And in fact, you know, even though my PhD is in psychology, I do really interdisciplinary work, essentially applying evolution to understanding behavior and how systems work. And so so despite the fact that my degrees are in psychology, I kind of span a lot of different areas. And, um, you know, my work is sort of everything from um, computational modeling, um, which I I do myself, I code things, um, to growing kombucha in my lab, um, to really working on kind of deep philosophical and ethical issues about human nature and autonomy and who we really are. Well, really, it's, you know, it's interesting that, that your background's in psychology, but a lot of your work is in the world of microbiology and in microorganisms, because, you know, when, well, I saw your presentation on the fermentology uh, series that uh, North Carolina State does, and I met you at North Carolina State at a symposium we were at together, and I was fascinated by the fact that somehow, you know, you, you live in that world as well, and, and uh, I don't know if I'm explaining this correctly, but I almost use the the imagery of zombie zombification and zombies as a metaphor for being able to really get a handle on what's going on in real life these days and i think that's kind of a fascinating you know sort of way of enveloping creation thanks so much yeah i I mean for for me really my interest in all these different systems is really rooted in like i really want to understand how cooperation evolves and why conflict happens and i ended up kind of academically in the field of psychology because that was sort of the most convenient field for me to be studying that phenomenon but really my deep interests are in it as a general thing that applies to lots of different systems right you could look at you know how are humans cooperating and sharing resources. You could look at how are microbes in kombucha cooperating and sharing resources, trans, you know, those metabolic pathways that are happening in kombucha, like those, there are lots of elements of cooperation that are happening there. Same thing with, you know, sourdough bread, same thing with cheese. So, you know, you have these dynamics that are, are really similar across these different systems. Also the human body, right? We are made of about 30 trillion cells. And the only reason that we can think and talk and walk and like interact with each other right now is because those cells are cooperating and coordinating to make us viable. So yeah. these things apply on so many different levels. So it's kind of like a window. You I mean, you use psychology as your window in, but really it's opened you up into a much bigger world. Uh, and then you, in order to be able to kind of uh, create language and, and connections within that world, uh, you tie it together with, again, I keep coming back to zombies because no no time in history has has the concept of zombies ever been more relevant than right now. I mean, we're dealing with, I I would think, a a type of, uh, it feels to me this COVID thing is almost like a zombie apocalypse. And that's your theme is the zombie apocalypse. So you even have a, a, a symposium that you run, right? Called, isn't it the zombie apocalypse symposium? 
Uh, so I run a, a meeting, an academic conference called the Zombie Apocalypse Medicine Meeting, yeah. which is an interdisciplinary meeting. So everybody from um, you know medical doctors to um, psychologists to evolutionary biologists that study parasitism to scholars who study zombie literature and zombie movies, um, everybody comes together and sort of talks about you know, how can we use this frame to actually grapple with the challenging issues that we're facing today and in the future? Yeah, I mean, when I was a kid, zombies meant like invasion of the body snatchers or or Night of the Living Dead. And now in the last couple of years, some of these big, these TV series are just all about essentially the invasions of, and, and, and the apocalypse of zombies. And yet, uh, yeah, and we still think of it as science fiction in one mode, but it's really not science fiction. It's it's not even fiction. It's science. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. You know, and there is this sort of space where like some zombies are real and some zombies aren't right. So like the zombies that lumber around with their flesh falling off and don't have blood, like that's not real. That's not possible. But, <laughs> okay. um, Let's you clear know, that up right away. Right. <laughs> right. Like that's not thermodynamically possible. I don't um, need to but, be carrying my big ax right now. Right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But you know, somebody like lumbering across the street like this, right. Like you yeah. see that all the time and that's a kind of zombie. So I think, Think, you know we can kind of take this idea of zombies and think about it as a, a tool for um, reflecting on our own autonomy you know how conscious are we when we're spending four and a half hours a day on our cell phones um, so you know those kinds of issues of technology and and then the, of course there's the connection to sort of issues with infectious disease so the way that yeah. zombies have been envisioned in a lot of the more sort of recent film and television, is that something contagious? Original zombies were not contagious. Like the Haitian zombie is not a contagious zombie, but the more recent zombies are kind of like incorporating these ideas, I think about fear of contagion from disease. So things like, you know, from yeah. the plague and stuff like that. So, so now this notion of zombie that we have as a contagious individual that is really trying to spread this zombie disease, um, I think does resonate with the present circumstances. Um, yeah. So, so there's, a, there's a lot of ways that the zombie idea connects. And I think it creates a space for us to think about and talk about these challenging issues that is more fun, more playful, brings in imagination, rather than kind of front loading everybody with a lot of fear and dread. Yeah. Yeah. And I think that's extremely valuable because, you know, we know psychologically that when you're afraid, your mind becomes narrower. It's harder to consider um, other options that you might not have explored before. So zombies help expand our minds, ironically. Well, they, and, they help, and they help give an image for explaining, you know, behavior and, and things. But, and I know you've got some things to show us in a little bit. I want to get to some of your things like your kombucha starters. And, and you know, because this ties into uh, a lot of our viewers are pizza makers or artists and bakers and, and you know, people that in the culinary side of the world. Um, and this ties into it because fermentation kind of, again, connects with the idea of organisms kind of taking over and, and uh, doing some, some things. So you've got some starters. So you even got a pizza dough made with a kombucha starter that we'll look at in a few minutes. So I want, I want to come back to that. And those of you who are watching, please hang in there because I want you to see some of these things that I think has been growing in her home. Uh, but <laughs> My mad the, science lab. Yeah, mm. and, and the imagination <laughs> kind of has like exploded with this. So, but before we do, uh, just to lay a baseline, could you, define really what you mean by zombie what is zombie and zombification you know in this more academic sense yeah so i think about a zombie as an entity whose uh, physiology or behavior is under the full or partial control of another entity that is not genetically the same and so it's kind of a technical way of looking at it. But say, um, you know, say somebody put some electrodes in my brain and stimulated them and it made my arm go up like this. That would be definition of zombification. Say um, you have a, an ant that is taken over by a cordyceps fungus to climb up to a place where it wouldn't otherwise go and then have the cordyceps fungus explode all over and infect other ants. That ant was zombified because it's getting taken over by something that is not genetically the same. As well, let me ask you around that, like about a couple hundred years ago, there was a, an ergot infestation of the rye uh, berries. 
that cause people to become essentially insane and, and hallucinate. Is that a type of zombification? Certainly. Yeah. And, you know, some, sometimes zombification is intentional and sometimes it's not. And in the biological world, you know, most of the time um, zombification is happening without the um, you know, the individual knowing they're being zombified or the agent of zombification, even knowing that they're doing the zombification, because a lot of things that can have effects on behavior, um, you know, are are plants that have properties, are, um, you know, microorganisms that create toxins. So they're not, you know, intentionally trying to manipulate, but um, they can, under some circumstances, actually evolve to be good manipulators because that helps their evolutionary fitness. Not always, but sometimes. So, so when, when suddenly we find ourselves feeling moody, but, but to the max, you know, not beyond just a normal mood, but all of a sudden we're just saying, we're not feeling ourselves. You know, I just don't feel like myself today. Uh, and we find that maybe we we're fighting off some kind of a virus or this or that, that is affecting the way we perceive ourselves or the way we actually behave. Is that another example of zombification? Yeah, I would say that's probably a you know minor level of zombification. Um, if, on the other hand, you were infected with rabies, right, and it was causing you to foam at the mouth and yeah. try to bite, like th- that would be a much more intense form of zombification. Uh, but, yeah, that makes more sense, yeah. Yeah, but uh, you know, the microbes that live in and on us they have uh, uh, you know access to our brains through our our guts. So you know there our guts have nerves inside them that are directly connected to our brains, and also microbes in our guts can produce all sorts of compounds that are actually able to interact with our nervous system. So they can produce human neurotransmitters, and they can produce mimics of human neurotransmitters and hormones. So so they are producing the same things that our body produces to control itself. So they have access. And um, there's some evidence that um, certain microbes do affect human behavior. So um, some microbes tend to actually um, increase people's stress responses. Some are make people more resilient to stress. In fact, I can show you, I've got my my yogurt here. So I make yogurt. Um, I made this a few days ago. Um, yogurt has lactobacillus in it and most sort of, um, uh, uh, fermentations that, you know, are based on milk have lactobacillus in them and lactobacillus actually, um, will create sort of a greater resilience to stress. So it's been um, shown to, um, reduce the intensity of stress response, um, in mouse models and in some uh, experiments, or not, I think there were controlled trials um, with humans, they had some effects as well. So lactobacillus is maybe, we could either think of it as an anti-zombification agent, if it helps you not get as you know stressed out by things, or I don't know, maybe it's benefiting somehow from uh, yeah. Yeah. making us relax. So, but I, I, I have it all the time. I love mine. It's like garlic, right? Yeah. Garlic and the uh, and the vampires. <laughs> <laughs> garlic is a very potent antimicrobial, so you know it's uh, yeah. not uh, not totally out there that you might want to use use garlic to um, keep away the undead. So this, so yeah, exactly. So so like like this, or like a wolf man, you know, the wolf man mythology. That's a type of zombification. It sounds like where we've been taken over by something external to ourselves that causes us to actually change and be something different than what we perceive ourselves to be. Yeah. Now, so I've got one more area I want to explore with you in this segment before we, we take a break and, and uh, look at some of your, some of your uh, well, especially your kombucha and talk about some of the things you can do with fermentation um, is I've become fascinated recently with the whole notion of the merging of artificial intelligence and human intelligence. And, and I, as soon as I start thinking about it, I start immediately thinking about, again, in, in terms of now zombification, because it seems as if and, and things are suddenly fast tracked from sort of, again, AI being a Tom Cruise movie or something in the future that, you know, and we see it coming in 50 years from now, we'll have to deal with it to something that's right on top of us now. And there seems to be a merger of the human species and the artificial intelligence species, if we could call it that, and something 
totally new and different is coming out of that. Or is this does this jive with some of the things that you've been talking about at your at your gatherings and stuff? Yeah, well, so my take on this is that the critical issue is really um, what um, what we call memes. Now, now, I'm not talking about just internet memes, you know, like the pictures with words yeah. that my kids are, you know, sharing with their friends, but memes in this technical sense that Richard Dawkins defined them um, no. as essentially these units of cultural information that can be transmitted from brain to brain. And so when Dawkins came up with this idea and I published it in the 70s, this was before the internet was really a thing. So yeah. when he was thinking of memes, right, it was these units of cultural information that I might say it to you, you might like it, you might spread it. Maybe it's written down and the, you know, and it spread that way. You know, the printing press was huge for memes, right, because these culturally transmitted ideas could get into people's brains. But now um, we have a situation where these ideas, um, any pieces of cultural information can spread really quickly. Now, there are a lot of good things about that, right? Um, because having more knowledge, being able to share ideas um, is really what a lot of what human civilization is based on. But memes have their own fitness function. Let me explain what I mean by that. Oh. The memes that are best at getting into your brain and then getting you to transmit them will be the memes that are most prevalent because they're good at getting themselves into brains. Can you give me an example? So um, what if I say to you, um, you know, Peter, um, if you don't um, give this uh, message to 50 other people, then all your whole family is going to die. Oh, yeah. So this is sort of like the, the classic the chain, chain letter. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, so that's, you know, that is a meme that very clearly has its own fitness function, right? Because it's telling you if you yeah, don't yeah. propagate it, you'll have consequences. But, um, you know, there you could also propagate a meme with positive consequences, right? Like, well, you know, there's really, really good news, you know, actually, our world is perfect. There's no problems. Nobody has to worry about anything. Um, that's great news. And maybe you feel like you want to spread that. Or maybe I have a juicy rumor. Um, might be true, might not be true. Um, but if it makes you want to spread it, then it's able to propagate itself. So it's like a, like a song that you can't get out of your head is kind of becomes a meme. Then, and, and if I say, uh, you know, come on, get, be happy, you know, or something like that, I start singing that song and all of a sudden you can't get it out of your head. Is yep. that transmitting a meme? In the, exactly. In the, exactly. So, so, or like when, when, what happened, like, you know, a few years ago when somebody says that the president of the United States is not an American and suddenly that becomes this rumor that you were describing and it suddenly takes hold, it gets cultural significance. Is that a meme too? Yeah. Yeah. And so now because of the speed at which these memes can be spread, and then we also, you know, there's another level that's been introduced, which relates to this AI issue, which is all these algorithms, social media, they are also looking for the memes that have the um, that get people's attention the most. Sometimes the memes that make people angry or activate them in other ways, because those keep people engaged on the platforms. So now you have this sort of symbiosis between, you know, memes that have their own fitness function, some of which are really not in our best interests, yeah. and then these platforms that want to keep us engaged, um, not necessarily for our own good, but because they are able to sell more ads if we're, yeah, you know. So we're being manipulated, constantly being, mani can be manipulated by. The zombification. By the, yeah. Wow. Wow. Yeah. All right, my head's exploding. This is cool. This is such great stuff. Yeah, I love it. I love it. And, and before we take a break, uh, if people do want to, I don't want them to have to wait to the end to get this. If people want to like find out more about what you're doing, what's the best website or way to, for them to connect with you on this? Uh, so my website is just athenaactipus.org if you want to learn about me. If um, you want to see my podcast or listen to my podcast, that's zombified.org. And um, for the conference, it's zombiemed.org. Oh, uh, wait, when you say, uh, what was the, what was the uh, podcast again? Zombified. Zombified. Yeah. And, then, and that's the podcast. And then... Um, Z there it is, zombified. All right. Episodes about placental hijacking. How often do you uh, do you uh, put up podcasts? Um, we're about to start the third season, and then once we start it, it's usually once a week that we release. Wow. The so there's an archive of all sorts of stuff there. If people want to 
bring that up. And then yeah. again, what's the what's the conference? Uh, Zombie um, Med. I e z o m b i e. Yep. Right? M e d. Zombiemed. Dot org. Dot org. Okay. All right. So you know how to follow up on this because I have a feeling a lot of you are watching this are going to want to like pursue this. Uh, and who knows? Maybe we'll see you at one of the conferences. Uh, and when we come back, we're going to continue with uh, Athena Octopus or Doctor Athena. We'll say we'll just it's all right. You can just tell me like, Athena. <laughs> I like I like Doctor Athena because it makes it sound like you have know, more authority. Um, <laughs> who's going to, who's who's imbuing us with sort of a whole new way of looking at the world through the metaphor of zombies and the reality of zombies? Um, but we want to see. Uh, we want to turn this into like a discussion now about. Um, a little bit of fermentation and what you know the, the use of microorganisms in a positive sense can do to help maybe improve the products that you're making and the work that you're doing. We'll be back. Join us in part two of uh, the zombie apocalypse with Athena Tipicus. Actipus. Actipus. I'm. I got to get my head around that too. That's all right. And she's coming to us from Arizona State. University, which is where in Tempe or is that in Tempe, right? Arizona? Tempe, Arizona, and uh, and I'm in Charlotte, uh, North Carolina. We'll be back on the next part of Pizza Talk. Join us in part two. Stick around for more Pizza Quest after a word from our sponsor. The Big Food Question is partnering with TD Bank on five special episodes about the resilience of small businesses in the face of a constantly shifting pandemic landscape. We cover avenues for accessing grants, loans, and financial services through federal and local government programs, as well as via nonprofits. We examine the benefits worker cooperatives present to workers, communities, and our food system, and share resources to learn more about operating under this model. We're talking to business owners who started pop-ups and became permanent during the pandemic to see what we can learn Don't miss these episodes. Subscribe to The Big Food Question wherever you get your podcasts. Thanks to TD Bank for supporting this programming. Welcome back to Pizza Talk. I'm with Athena Actipus. Dr. Athena, we're so glad to hear all this sort of big picture stuff about zombies and zombification and what I really want to get into now with you in part two is your journey from sort of the, from this image of zombies into fermentation and your, I'll call it your journey from kombucha to pizza. And uh, <laughs> tell us a little bit about that. Yeah. So I, uh, I got really interested in kombucha. Um, I think it was about four years ago when um, I, I just really enjoyed the taste of it. I kind of got addicted to it and um, as you know, it's like $5 for a bottle of it. Right. So I, I, at some point I was like, okay, this habit a little pricey. Let me look into brewing it myself. And I realized that it was not that hard, you know, it just took like getting a few supplies. And, um, so I set up, um, I actually have it over here. You can see, um, my first, um, kombucha <laughs> starter. My, yeah. This, so this was like the earliest of my lab. So you can see I've got got a little spout there so um i can drain it when it's ready without having to take everything out which is nice um and that was sitting um in my kitchen for uh about uh maybe six months or so before i um i started just getting obsessed i would like come home from work and have a little kombucha i'd sit at the kitchen table and i'd look at it and be like what is happening in there yeah, yeah. Exactly. You know, there's like little bubbles floating yeah. up and like, like, what's the science? Like, what's happening in there? How is my kombucha getting made while I am just sitting here, right? Because it's kind of magical, right? You just, you're not doing anything. And then you go from having, you know, this sweet tea, basically really, you know, sweet tea to having this, you know, fizzy, yeah. lightly alcoholic, acidic drink so um so i started but, 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 but before you uh, continue on that how does this notion of uh, a kombucha how does it relate to what we were talking about with zombies before is it this is this an example of of an organism taking over and turning it into something else 
Well, we're still really trying to figure out all of the metabolic interactions that are happening in kombucha. My, um, my interest in kombucha really started from my gustatory interest in it. And then it really grew into me um, realizing once I started looking into it, that all these interactions that were happening among the microbes, um, that there was cooperation happening. So that, you know, how the microbes themselves were interacting, um, they were producing public goods, so the SCOBY, it actually, you know, creates this sort of protective layer that keeps other microbes from coming in. Um, the acid that's produced also helps to, um, you know, keep the, the whole system from getting invaded. So, um, so it's a little, you know, it's, it's kind of a little microcosm of cooperation. Um, the, the zombification part uh, and the sort of zombie apocalypse part of fermentation, I think, um, you know, when we start thinking about how microbes can affect human behavior for better or worse, um, that it's really in that relationship that you have the potential for these, um, you know, positive and negative zombification dynamics, kind of like I was mentioning with the lactobacillus, which um, I feel strangely compelled to make on a regular basis. I wonder who's responsible for that. <laughs> Well, some notion, some meme has gotten into your head saying, hey, this is good for you. And I think it's a good meme. <laughs> yeah. Um, and, and I'll just mention another tie-in. Like, for me, when I kind of think about the zombie apocalypse and, and fermentation, there's a, like, playful side of me that's like, well, you know, in the zombie apocalypse, being able to ferment things would be a really great skill, right? Like that's on my list of zombie apocalypse skills because, you know, are you going to be able to get clean water? Maybe not. So if you can have a fermentation where you have microbes that can actually control the growth of other microbes, um, you know, then you can have a system where you don't have as many pathogens in what you're drinking or eating. Um, and that is, you know, one of the oldest solutions to, you know, food preservation and food safety that humans have invented, right? Fermentation is uh, a, a very ancient practice. So you called it earlier, so like sort of an anti-zombification, so protection against being zombified by or taken over by something in a negative sense. Yeah, yeah. So you know, th th this is this is my anti anti-zombie arsenal here with my you know kombucha and my yogurt, and um, I've got some uh, fermented fermenting radishes back here too. So you know, I I, I enjoy. Um, so those are radishes that you're fermenting in in kombucha, right? Did you just do, do them like almost like a, a kimchi type thing? Why did you make that that fermenta fermented? Yeah, so, so um, I did it in a fairly classic way, but I did add a little kombucha, and um, and I, actually with. A lot of my fermentations, I start them with kombucha, but then I propagate them on their own. So, like I've, um, I propagated that radish um, juice, I guess, or the you know the fermentation um, uh, juice from a previous radish fermentation. Um, so but it was originally the starter, like well, like one batch becomes the starter for the next. Yeah, batch. yeah. But I've started everything pretty much with kombucha um because i have it you know it's like it's what i have with me and i know that it has a lot of diverse microbes in it and um and then you know as it uh ferments with different things it i'm sure that the composition of it is is changing i mean i haven't you know sequenced it over the course of you know different fermentations but um just on first principles you know we know that these different you know vegetables or grains or um you know, milk or whatever, whatever you're using. Actually, I don't put kombucha in milk. That's the one thing that <laughs> I don't wouldn't do. That, wouldn't that kombucha turn the milk into yogurt? Um, it, it made it just disgusting. So I don't, oh, really? I, I don't mix my kombucha <laughs> with my. So that would be an example of a, a sort of a negative uh, aspect of uh, cross, cross pollinating. Yeah, I suspect that they're just, they're very um, different populations. And, you know, and I, I know from the sequencing I have done of the kombucha, because I actually brought this kombucha into my lab, not, not this particular container, but I brought 
some of the kombucha into my lab and now we have it in my lab and we're growing it and we're doing experiments on it um, to see like how good it is at keeping pathogens out and um, how good it is at sort of maintaining its uh, the, the different species in it when you um, put in gross things like hand swabs from festivals. So we've, uh, <laughs> we've been playing with it and um, it turns out that kombucha is amazing at um, kind of regulating itself, um, keeping the species in it um, from getting taken over by, uh, by human pathogens. So uh, to me, that's really exciting. Can you, can you hold up your kombucha again and, and talk a little bit about the SCOBY? You mentioned SCOBY sure. earlier. So it's many super people already know about uh, kombucha, but many don't. They don't understand it's what a SCOBY heavy. is. So I'm going to bring this over okay. Thanks. here. And... I don't know if you can, can you see? Oh yeah, you got a big bag. It's a little, that's, that's yeah. like a three gallon yeah. cup there. So the SCOBY is actually, um, it's like cellulose. So what happens is the um, microbes actually turn the sugars into um, these sort of long strands. Um, and then those strands kind of stick to each other and they float. And then eventually they kind of, create this this pancake-like um, material that becomes um, kind of harder and, and more leathery um, as time goes on. And, and if you touch it, it almost feels a little like skin. So Yeah, like it, it, at yeah. first, when it's young, it looks it feels like a little bit like a floating mushroom. Yeah. Uh, and then, but later it gets more more yeah. hard and mushroom pithy yeah. and and uh, becomes almost like, uh, like, like, a, like uh, leather. Yeah. Yeah, and that's, uh, I think of that as one of the main sort of cooperative um, elements of the kombucha is this, you know, creation of this biofilm that then protects the whole system from invaders that might come in and also from drying out. So is the SCOBY itself kind of like a starter, like a mother starter? Is it loaded with these organisms? Can you take that SCOBY and, and use it as a starter in a brand new batch of kombucha and just sort of jumpstart the whole thing? Yeah, so so there's a bunch of different ways you can start a new batch. Um, the usual way um, that people recommend, like if you look on the web, um, is to start with some kombucha and then start also with a scoby. Now, um, one of the reasons that it's good to have some of the kombucha is uh, because it's acidic, and so it keeps it from getting invaded before it's had a chance to take hold. Because essentially, you know, if you're if you're brewing a bunch of sweet tea, that is just you know delicious for all sorts of pathogenic microbes right. it's just a bunch of shit it's a bowl of sugar <laughs> yeah exactly yeah so um to acidify it a little bit um is good so if you start with just the scoby you'd have the micros but you might not have um that much acidity which nice. could be a challenge um i actually haven't tried starting it um, with just a SCOBY in the lab, but we have tried starting it with just the starter and not a SCOBY because yeah. um, we wanted to create a protocol that would be highly repl replicable. So we basically take a bunch of the starter um, or a bunch of the kombucha itself and kind of, you know, make sure it's mixed and then put a certain amount of it so we can do multiple replicates so that we have good comparisons. Um, so that really was driven by a methodological need that we had in the lab to control things. Um, and it turns out it works um, just fine as long as you start with enough initial starter at the beginning. Um, it will form a SCOBY and, uh, you know, you'll be able to then use that to brew kombucha. It's interesting that you mentioned that about starting with a little acidification because uh, we came up with a technique uh, uh, for sourdough starter years ago when I was having a problem with a lot of starters taking longer than they should have, or maybe some people were saying, my, my starter went bad, it got invaded or something. Mm. And so, we, so uh, a chemist I know, or a microbiologist I knew, came up with a technique where you, if you start on day one, that when you're building a starter from, from scratch, from, from a seed, use some pineapple juice as the liquid for day one, mm. just to get some acid going at the beginning, it, it helps to protect it against the wrong bacteria taking charge. So it's so it kind of makes sense, and yet okay. So in this sense, you, uh, there's a parallel between the sourdough starter and the and the kombucha, and you've been able to like make make that bridge because you're not you're you're not using your kombucha to make to make sourdough, right? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's fascinating that you say that about starting with the acidity, um, because yeah, I did. I started. I, I, 
at, once I kind of got my kombucha going, um, I, I actually, um, again, this was all, you know, just driven by my gustatory needs. Um, I love bread. And um, a couple of years ago, I stopped really being able to tolerate eating most bread. Mm-hmm. I would have, you know, stomach discomfort and I would just f- feel like crap. Just felt yeah, horrible. A lot of people, a lot of people were, were yeah. Sick. With yeast and, bread. and I was like, oh, like, how can I not, how, how can I go without bread? And um, I, I went to Europe and tried bread there and it was fine. I was like, huh, maybe yeah. there's something about actually the microbes and the way that the bread is being prepared. So why don't I try to make my own bread? And then of course, because I, you know, had the kombucha, I was like, well, why don't I try sourdough? And I also had heard that, you know, sometimes people who have problems with other bread, they can eat sourdough just fine. So right. yeah. I, I was like, all right, this is going to be my project. I'm going to do it. And I know that, you know, you, you can start right just with like gathering the microbes in the air, but why not? Since I have, you know, already all these microbes growing here, why don't I start my starter with that? So I um, began my starter with a little bit of kombucha and um, the first couple of loaves of bread that I made um, were Um, they weren't exactly kind of what I would have wanted, but they were really interesting. They were kind of a little denser, harder, almost had like a little bit of a, um, a, a cheesy kind of taste to them in a, in Uh a good way. Um, and, uh, so it was, you know, very early in this transition where I was like, okay, well, why don't I actually go with this? So I, I made a few little pizzas from the very early dough and then it matured into something that creates, um, you know, bread dough. So I can show you, this is my, this is my starter now, um, which I you keep in the up, fridge. Hold it up a little higher so we yeah. can see the bubbles. Yeah. Well, and let me see if I can open it up here so I can, I can show it to you better. Oh, no. Okay. Yeah. T- yeah. There you go. Okay. Yeah. So it's kind so, of a wet, spongy starter. Uh-huh. Yeah. And it, uh, what does it smell like? It, um, smells kind of, earthy and tangy. Nah. So, okay, yeah, yeah. yeah and this, is, and this is a starter that was started with, with uh, kombucha, but then as you continue to use it, did you f- always feed it with kombucha or did you use just water and flour? After? No, I just used water and flour after. So I, it was just kind of originated with kombucha. And um, I kind of have a unique way of taking care of it, which um, you might want to call benign neglect. So um, <laughs> I, um, when I feed it, I put it in the fridge right away because when you put it in the fridge, the metabolism slows down. So that means I don't have to feed it every day. Right. So I can, I keep it in the fridge and then, you know, if I'm not making bread every week, then I'll, you know, feed it at least once a week. But I basically just, you know, keep it in the fridge and um that keeps it from kind of expending itself too quickly because it's it it develops enough yeast to be able to leaven your bread yeah here i've got um a loaf i made yesterday and it's it's not the fluffiest loaf um because i let the bread go um in the Uh fridge the other thing that i do is I make two loaves at a time. So I'll usually have one loaf that's a little, you know, fresher and usually fluffier. So yeah. the first one was about up to here. And yeah. then I'll keep the rest of the dough in the fridge. Um, and then I'll, I'll usually get a, you know, not as fluffy one, but I don't, I don't mind it that much. And then yeah. I, I can have fresh bread. And most Quite importantly, you can digest it and tolerate it. It doesn't make you sick. Exactly. Yeah. There's, and that's kind of the big thing. And this is why I think we're seeing more and more interest uh in sourdough across the board uh, yeah. you know we always say it uh, at my bread symposium every year we say the future of bread lies in its past meaning mm. the, the original way that it was made with natural starters as opposed to commercial yeast is really yeah. where we're headed yeah and I, and you're onto it you know through and you came in through a whole different window through kombucha but it's kind of interesting because you used your kombucha as the seed culture to get the starter going yeah and then after that it sort of takes care of itself yeah. Yeah. And then for making pizza dough, yeah. I, I do use kombucha sort of fresh and it's nice because it's, it's almost like a, a quick shortcut to having a, a leavened 
sourdough. You don't have to have, you don't have to keep a starter on hand. Um, if you have kombucha, you can just use that. And um, so I have here um, dough that I made last night. I'll, I'll show you. Oh, wow. Um, so and you, so, you made that with just kombucha? No, you didn't use starter or anything in that? I didn't use any starter. And wow. well, let me see if I can set this up so I can actually show you what it's like. Okay. Um, let me get my here. So, so yeah, I, I just substituted kombucha for half of the, um, uh, the water. water oh, now huh? you're just seeing my screen. Let me get, I'll, I'll, I'll get it up in my hand so I can show you. So this is. Yeah, there you go. This is the dough. I've got olive oil on it, and I'm, I'm not going to handle it too much because I don't want it to be totally, um, you know, lose all its elasticity from making. Right. But you but you tonight. made this dough just yesterday, and it will be usable for pizza tonight? Um, it can be. I, I've used it after two hours. And it's, wow. And, and yeah. just with kombucha, there's enough leavening in the kombucha to give you that, that, that gassy puff. Well, so it depends what you're going for. So I like my pizza crust to be um, a little thinner and a little denser. So for me, making it on the first day, um, it, it suits my tastes. Um, yeah. It'll get a little bit of rise, but um, it's not like it's not super puffy. Huh. Um, it's but if on the second day, you know, like when I make this tonight, it will probably get a little bit more rise. So, uh, you know, and it, it's really about kind of how do you like to eat your, yeah. your pizza. So I, I think it's fascinating that there's enough activity, enzyme or uh, bacterial activity in your pizza dough that even without a lot of fermentation, it's still digestible and tolerable to your system, which is sensitive to regular yeah. bread. Yeah, and I think the other thing is by adding half of the kombucha, not just you're not just adding some microbes, but you're also adding all of these microbial byproducts that mm -hmm. that are active, right? So the enzymes and everything that are in there are probably really quickly doing a bunch of work on the on on the grain. That's my guess. I'm I'm speculating here, but yeah, yeah. That's, I think that's part of what's going we on. Could, we could spend a long time, I think, and get a few other people in who have uh, who can tell us uh, sort of biologically what's going on in there because we know that at NC State they're analyzing you know, your starter and other people's starters to see which organisms are at work and which are the ones that create flavor and what kind of flavors do they create? Which are the ones that create carbon dioxide and gas and everything else? I mean, it's a fathomless subject. It's a fascinating subject. And I think is another reason why sourdough fermentation is becoming a big thing. It's better, yeah. you know, we're saying it's better for us, but it's also in terms of, in terms of memes, it's a, it's an idea that gets in our head and we can't kind of get that song out of our head once we once we taste it and play with it which is seems yeah. like what happened to you you've been taken over by your by your your kombucha and your starters which well, is it hasn't, hasn't just gotten in my head it's gotten in my gut yeah. so yeah in your gut and, <laughs> and you know they're even finding that that a sourdough starter can be made by the exact same method by two different people but their hands affect the flavors and the way it ferments too because it, so it's in our hands it's everywhere and uh well this is fascinating I, we could talk about this for hours and hours but we've run out of time and i think i really appreciate you sharing your story your journey um the fact that you know people who want to sort of stay tuned to you should get your you know your podcast uh which is uh, uh zombified right zombified yep. is the podcast and then zombiemed.org for uh, for finding out more about the the gatherings or the, is it would you call it a, a, a symposium or a uh, so it's an academic conference, conference. but we're, conference. we're holding it all online this year so it's super easy to join it'll be October fifteenth through eighteenth and um, a lot of it will be live streamed in an interactive way and then we'll have some some other really fun workshops and things so so definitely check it out. All right. Well, for those of you who are kind of opening up to uh, beyond going beyond uh, the the movie version of zombies to you know zombies in the bigger universal sense here, uh, welcome to the, the the zombie apocalypse with Athena Actipus. Thank you so much for being with us today on Pizza Talk and for opening our heads all this. We'd love to get you back again. Maybe I'm, I'm planning to attend the uh, you know the, the the conference when you have it, and uh, hopefully I'll. Will we be able to virtually interact with some of the other attendees uh, when we do it? 
Wonderful. Yeah. Well, it's been awesome to be on the show. Thanks for having me. And I can't wait to see you at Zam. We'll uh, have a, we'll try to put together a whole session about fermentation and the zombie apocalypse. Yeah. When I get to Arizona, I want to try some of your, uh, your uh, pizza though, your, your uh, you kombucha pizza though. So you it's bet. lots of good ideas for those of you who are watching, you know, uh, you can use that kombucha in a whole new way now and you can actually create doughs and starters and see how the flavor profiles you know, it are different from the ones made in your more traditional sense. So uh, I, it wouldn't surprise me to see uh, a kombucha pizzeria open up at some point. Maybe we'll get you one of those little um, uh, mobile pizza ovens and have you go out there making pizza for everybody at the, at the, <laughs> when we can gather in person again. <laughs> in fact, when we do gather in person, since you're in Arizona, we can definitely get somebody to come in with a pizza truck and make pizza with, uh, you know, with, with, your, with your pizza dough. Awesome. <laughs> cool. All right, Athena, thanks again for, for being here with me today. And, and all of you who are watching, thanks for joining us on Pizza Talk. We'll see you on the next episodes right here at pizzaquest.com. Thanks. Pizza Quest is powered by Simplecast. Thanks for listening to Heritage Radio Network, food radio supported by you. For our freshest content, subscribe to our newsletter. Enter your email at the bottom of our website, heritageradionetwork.org, and connect with us on Instagram and Twitter at heritage underscore radio. You can also find us at facebook.com slash heritage radio network. Heritage Radio Network is a nonprofit organization driving conversations to make the world a better fairer, and more delicious place. And we couldn't do it without support from listeners like you. Want to be a part of the food world's most innovative community? Subscribe to the shows you like, tell your friends, and please join the HRN family by becoming a member. Thanks for listening.